Welcome to Long Lost Friends. I'm Elizabeth Eve King. And I'm Andrea Goyen. Elizabeth and I used to do improv comedy together back when we were 19. But we lost touch. And then a couple of years ago, we found each other again and discovered... I'd become a painter, a writer, a performer, a Pilates teacher, an animal lover, and a biologist. Hey, I'm a painter, performer, writer, Pilates teacher, animal lover, and... Well, okay, I'm not a biologist, but we're Here. long lost friends. <laughs> <laughs> and we're both speculative fiction writers. My work has appeared in Metastellar. Metastellar, for those of you who don't know, is an online magazine that specializes in publishing original science fiction, horror, and fantasy. There's a link below. Hi, and welcome back. Today, we are privileged to have Charlton Pettis join us for another session. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with Charlton, he is a musician. And since 2000, he has been a guitarist, producer, and writer for Tears for Fears. He is also the writer of a novel called Exit Strat, whoops, let's get it there, Exit Strategy. <laughs> And he's currently working on developing a children's show for Disney called Kindergarten the Musical. And today we're delighted to have him back and we're just going to talk about musicals and what it's like to write those darn things. Yeah, do you start with like a, you start with, a, I assume, a plot and a, where you're going? Do you start with characters? Because Yeah, I, I mean, the, char the characters is definitely the first big key hurdle and then yeah then then it's just the story and it's the normal kind of process the only difference being I don't know if you guys are index card people but if you're an index card person you know you have those first few cards that kind of have your big beats and moments and in a musical they're almost all songs so you're you're in a way the process is kind of easier like all the big important events our musical numbers and then you're just kind of stitching those musical numbers together oh i have a question we, we we've spoken to you before about the process of songwriting like for uh for rock and roll or other kinds of songs like that for tears for fears and things what is it like to write a song for a musical because i imagine it's a sort of different process very different yes yeah, yeah so how does because like we were saying, uh, when you're writing a pop song, you, you usually don't start with a clear idea of what it's about. You start with, you know, a feeling or a, you know, gift from your subconscious or something. With a musical, you know exactly what it's about. And not only do you know exactly what it's about, you know exactly where it's coming from and where it's going to. And you know that completely unlike pop songs, something has to happen in the song. Like you end up with your character transformed or at a different place. Um, you know, in pop songs, if, if pop songs do that, they always feel terrible. It's like, like the quintessentially cheesy thing to have happen in a pop song is for something to happen, right? Like a pop <laughs> songs, a pop songs, we always describe it as like a snapshot. Like someone takes a picture and then you zoom way in and really get detailed about that instant, right? Just that moment. Whereas in country songs, to some extent, and in musicals, 100%, it's the exact opposite. You're, you're viewing a transformation. And if it doesn't do that, it doesn't really work. Like, it just feels boring. So do you write the lyrics first and then the music to go with it then? For me, they're still kind of together, like you know, you're, you're, you're looking for a, a rhythmic idea that kind of conveys what you're talking about. And you're looking for a phrase that sings good, that kind of does the same thing. But yeah, it's, it's very rhythm driven. You know, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to find if it's urgency, the urgency, if it's doubt, the doubt, like that's always kind of a rhythmic thing. And then it's a mood thing. It's like a rhythm mood thing. Yeah, because a musical, like, think of it, you're, you're asking people to sit in a confined space, uncomfortable for three hours or something crazy. So they got to feel like stuff's happening. You know, you can't, 
you can't just kind of sit there and absorb it. You have to be engaged and, and it has to move you forward. It's, a, it's uh, you know, it, it's, it's challenging. Yeah, well, I mean, it seems to me so it almost, I mean, like and not like writing a song because you've got, you can't just rely on that art or that inspiration. You've got to hit beats basically, and you've got to hit moods. Do you ever, like, do you write sometimes the music and somebody else writes the lyrics or vice versa? Um, I guess I have, not very often. Like, I, I find it's easier to do them in tandem. Um, but if someone else writes the words, it's a, a lot easier like that's so much easier like someone just gives you a lyric and you just kind of shape it into a thing definitely quicker and easier but uh yeah it hasn't happened a ton in my life you know there's a bird right behind you oh yes i have it this is pitch right once in a while yeah i know you do <laughs> angry bird that's brilliant that's brilliant Angry bird, angry bird. You're an angry bird, aren't you? Yeah, you are. Sometimes he likes it when I grab his head. <laughs> well, that's because you used to feed that him. Seems so improbable. <laughs> you should have seen some of her earlier, the birds she had earlier this year, like the woodpeckers and all of those crawling all over her. Oh that yeah, I had wood, and then and then you know, uh, you know, babies like uh, either pigeons or magpies when they don't have any feathers. They're quite ugly. <laughs> I mean, they're amazingly ugly. They are. So uh, back to musicals. Yes, sorry. No, no, that's okay. No, I don't. I, I love the distraction, <laughs> but I'm. I, I wanted. I was about to ask Charlton. I think you said you have um, a musical coming out in like a record no. number or sort of. Um, Right before the pandemic, uh, I was working with an English singer named Chesney Hawks, and we had a playwright and a director, and we were putting this musical together. We did a show in, I guess, 2019 in London. We were developing, blah, 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 the whole thing you do. It's another one of those processes that kind of goes on forever. You know, you, get, you find your off, 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 off Broadway, and you kind of do it a few times, see what works, blah, blah, blah. We're doing all that pandemic happened and the whole thing ground to a halt. And so we decided kind of in the thick of the lockdown to make the cast recording album first, which I guess people have done. It's kind of a thing. Um, so we did that and uh, that's pretty much just done. I'm, I'm just waiting for one missing vocal and then we're gonna put that out. So we will not have actually staged it since 2019, but we will put the record out and kind of see what happens, I guess. And um, what's it called? It's called Number One. Um, he, he was never very well known here, but in England, he was pretty famous for having this big single called The One and Only um, back in the 90s. And like many, many artists, that was the only big hit he ever had. So it started out basically just as a story of the life of someone who's basically a one hit wonder um, and how, you know, that takes you to some interesting places as you kind of try and find your place in the world. Um, and then it kind of grew from that into a slightly more complicated story about all the standard musical subjects, you know, redemption, uh, loss, resurrection, blah, 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 blah. Not in a tossy way like that sounded, but in a kind of, you know, just trying to fix yourself, fix your family, that kind of stuff. Um, and yeah, it ended up being, I think, a, a pretty universal story. And it was, it was, it was good. Um, you know, hopefully we'll get to see it at some point. Yeah. How many characters are in it that are, like you said, you have vocals. So who, how many different well, main the, characters? The, the principals are the character who's basically Chesney, who's named Duncan in this case, Chesney Hawks, Duncan Falconer, it's bird jokes. Uh, his brother, 
um, and the woman they were both in love with or the girl they were both in love with. So it's basically those three people, but we have overlapping timelines. So it's them as young people and then them as old people, older oh. people. So, and sometimes those, you know, like the young version of the girl has a duet with her older self, you know, kind of hey. self-recrimination and that kind of thing. So that's six. And then there's a couple other minor characters and some chorus slash people at the pub because it all takes place in a pub sort of. Um, you know, there's that whole English pub theater thing, pub music. I have recently learned how very, 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 very important pubs are to English people. Pubs are life. I mean, that it's yeah. literally all there is. We had an English guest on who was talking about life in the pub. And that night I was out with someone who was English who's here. And she's like, I'm going to fly back for a few days because I have to go to a pub. I have to get into a pub and meet some interesting people. That's it. I mean, it's, it's, it's the culture. And so there is this whole subgenre of theater, which is, you know, pub musicals or pub theater where, you know, you're basically in a pub. And so our whole show is in a pub. Wow. And for, I mean, sometimes we like to pull our, 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 talks back to our writer and and our audience who tend to be speculative fiction people and just sort of go back and say you know it's it's interesting to me because the journey is the same whether you're writing you know as a, a short story that's a science fiction story or you're writing a musical that all of a sudden it took out you know it starts in one place and it goes to this whole other place and it's just that whole journey of writing is the same obviously a little different if you're writing songs, but I mean, when you're writing a longer piece or a music, or a theater piece, or it just, the, the journey is the same. Just want to kind of look at it and remind people that they're similar. But you raise an interesting subject. Why is there so little science fiction musical theater? Well, I was going to say, why don't we write one? Because the world needs another one. I mean, I feel like the only one I can even think of is Little Shop of Horrors, which well, Rocky Horror Picture Show, basically anything with horror in the title <laughs> might have a science fiction etymology, but th the world is ready. It's time. It's time. So. Let's do it. Metastellar the Musical. I mean, obviously that's the working title, right? Right. <laughs> it's got to be Metastellar the Musical. We're ready. We're dealing with it. it, it I think it'll be, have to be about fungus taking over. Right. What is the sound that's of a good. singing mushroom? <laughs> No, it would be Meta Stella, right? It would be a character named Stella, who Meta appears Stella. to be a suburban girl from New Jersey, but is actually an alien. Or a fictional, a meta stick character. There you go. I feel like we have a good start. I yeah. Think when's our next meeting? It's our, yeah, it's our journey. Meta, the, the journey of Meta Stella. In fact, that's the first song too, because it's about the guy who's telling his friends about this girl he met. I met a Stella. Wow. I just met a girl. <laughs> I just met a Stella. I just met a Stella. <laughs> and then it ends, yeah. up, it ends up with guys in pubs drinking Stella Artois. I never met a Stella I didn't like. It's a whole <laughs> thing. And uh, there's uh, a wine uh, that's very popular among Mexicans called Stella wine it's kind right. of sweet oh right it's got this the star thing right yeah, yeah yeah no no it's good it's good and then we can finally have someone go stella yeah sure that'll be it i think that's a turning point when it when this yeah the stanley kowalski character inexplicably shows up in the middle of act two with right the, with right. The wife beater and it's like yep. it, it's science fiction some people have a deus ex machina. We have a Marlon Brando. We have Stanley machina. Kowalski, right? <laughs> I like it, but that's how it happens. I mean, literally, it's those kinds of conversations that I think start most musicals. You're like, wait, what if it was a song? What if, yeah, that's well, that's that's cool. I mean, that would be fun to write. I don't know. I've never written songs though. But I think there is a. a 
minimal overlap in the Venn diagram of science fiction readers and musical theater goers. <laughs> but not opera. But I think I think musical theater has changed so much. Uh, you know, think of Hamilton. Think of where oh, totally, totally. And, and Rent. I mean, so I do. I think there is a much greater overlap than there used to be. And I think people like, are turning to science fiction and fantasy for not just dystopia, but also a little hope sometimes. There's a whole, well, it's called, what is it, solar punk now? Solar punk, which is like using science to punk people? fix the world. Oh, fancy. Well, they just use punk for anything. It's like it's, hope yeah. punk, solar punk, because it, it sounds better hard. than anything. Doesn't it seem hard to make optimistic science fiction because right if we think science fiction is always it's never really about the future it's about the present and since we're all pretty doom and gloomy about the present isn't dystopia almost a given yeah but that's i guess what that is what makes it interesting sometimes to come up with the options like what if you know how would you you know fix the ocean or how would you develop solar power like i i came i think this idea there so big clams underwater clams you know how they have those big lips that sort of glow yeah okay it's because they have living iridescent cells and tons of them in their lips and because the they're living iridescence they are able to capture light and sort of fan it down and so if they have all these little zoothalin these little um basically plant things inside them photosynthesizing like corals do but instead of corals that only have one they have these whole layers so i was thinking well what if you could take their live iridescence and make solar panels that would just you know and then you'd have these big clams all over the land and you know so I mean, yeah the, the musical is writing itself i just want to say <laughs> And maybe can't you just see them singing the clams? Hundred percent. I mean, it's feed me Seymour on steroids. It's magic. And and you've got all that wonderful iridescent, the, the lighting. I see the oh. lighting of the show. Uh -huh. it's amazing. So we're on to something. I do think you can. I do think it is hard. So I know for me writing uh, because it is such a dark time. I tend to write really dark, but I have found a couple where after I've like destroyed the world, the people who've survived have hope. Yeah, but I mean that that's you're doing the Noah trick. Everyone does the Noah trick. The Noah trick exists in every <laughs> or religious text, right? Like then God got pissed and killed everybody except this one guy, who who burnt him a lot of goat bits you know that's that's always the story and it's it it seems like a projection of, of our you know idea that you know the only thing that's wrong with the world is everyone but me right so if we got rid of all them it'd all be great right that's true <laughs> but that's but that goes well we won't go but down the problem is everyone thinks it's true well, everyone thinks and it's everyone true. else's narrative we got to go we don't we were not on the boat right that's that's true okay i didn't write that charlton but yes there is an element of that noah thing i guess i i'll have to revisit think about but, you know it's 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 a i mean i think that's a that's a real human impulse you look around and you think it's all fucked everyone's got to go <laughs> <laughs> exactly and who will be there to see our musical well, the the people the giant who clams. Re, re, no, they're in it. They are the entire, they, the entire cast could be them. Wow, that would be so cool. Oh, it's animated. It's big screen. It's iridescent giant clams singing. <laughs> I love this so oh, much <laughs> <laughs> because they are amazing creatures. Totally. And I'm sure that they communicate like trees much more than we humans have any idea. Because oh, yeah. All ecosystems have ways of communicating. Yep, yep. Right. absolutely. Yeah. And the, the, yeah, the ocean, especially. Well, it's and, and it's all this, you know, great symbiosis to create, you know, well, a clam or a coral or anything, you know, without their 
plant element, but they're both plant and animal together. So, you know, they must that, have that's our element. outer space. It's the outer space we actually have time to get to and get back from, right? Oh. It's like, uh, you no, know, we don't sulfur, need a big sulfur it vents. It in. I'm sorry. That's why, Charlton, do you dive? Are you a diver? Um, I was a diver. I'm no longer a diver only because once we had kids, we, you know, there isn't time for anything. Yeah. But yeah, pre-kids, we were divers. And it's, have you done it? I've done it once. Elizabeth does it a lot. It, a... it is magical. I mean, it is that, you know, if, if uh, flying is one of our fundamental fantasies, that's as close as you get. I mean, you're, you're weightless in a way. You're weightless. You're moving in three dimensions instead of two. It's, it's incredible. And it's you can't do sensation. that in, in real air. I mean, even hang gliding are saying it's not the same as having that control that you have underwater. Is totally. It, I mean, in real air, you're mostly falling. Unless you have a, an engine, you're falling. Right. falling I mean, style, as they say in Toy Story. When I was working on a piece that took place in outer space, I were talking about if you get into a pool, which isn't weighted like when you have your tank and everything, but it's the closest thing to outer space. Because if you push off, you have the momentum that just keeps carrying you. Keep going, yeah. Yeah, so it's a similar, I mean, obviously it's different, but it's the closest we can get. Oh, it's amazing. And yeah, I mean, just diving a wall or anything where you're kind of really moving down and and those just those moments, like when you... You know, you're in a kind of coral ecosystem. It's all very kind of cute and manageable. And then you turn around and you look just out into the open ocean. And it's this, I mean, it's terrifying. It's like, it's definitely space-like. Like it just seems infinite and empty. Yeah. Actually, yeah. You should do it. I had, I had trouble clearing my ears. So I couldn't get that. There's a new thing. What new thing? This is there's some new thing this guy told me about uh, last year. I was actually trapped on a little dive island. Uh, and, and one of the guys had these new things he put in his ears that he, he started, I can look up and find what they are because he said he had started getting some kind of issue and it, it helped him equalize. Because it's- oh, That's cool. I'd do it again if I could figure that out. I mean, Sudafed was always the go-to, which has the, everything about it is great, except it tends to make you a little paranoid, which can be bad. <laughs> Does it make you paranoid? Yeah, it's speed. That. It's basically speed, so it can make you a little tense. What? <laughs> but not what you really want to be underwater. No. Definitely not. Since sprinting to the surface is frowned on. It is frowned upon, yes. <laughs> uh, well, this is best. Yeah. Fun. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. Uh, it's I can't wait to both hear your new single and also check out some of the musicals and continue working on our meta. Uh, yeah, Meta Stella the Musical. Come Metastella on. The musical. Yeah, it's happening. All of which happens underwater. So you're going to have to get the diving thing together because the clams. <sighs> yeah. Fuck. So we got to we got to train you again. Yep. Oh, we have to do the best of, don't we? We have to say, what? We have to do our best ofs. I just realized we have to yeah, do our We have to do our, what was the best thing you learned this week? We got so distracted. So, oh man, I'm gonna, uh, well, I'm sort of gonna repeat one. I wasn't going to, but because we were talking about corals and everything, uh, there's a little island called Bonaire, part of the ABCs, the Dutch Antilles, Aruba, Bonaire, Carousel, and they have the best coral breeding program anywhere, growing little corals in the lab. They started with elk, then then stag, but now they're actually doing boulder, different kinds of boulder corals. Nobody else is doing this, and they grow them in the labs, and then they make these trees, and they plant them, and they clean them and last year for the first time one of these artificially made reefs uh, actually mm, what do you call it spawn produced eggs and sperm wow. and spawned and i'm always they're always looking for volunteers so i'm going december january february to go plant coral and clean it and stuff in bonaire so that's that's the best thing i i didn't really learn it this week though all right, so the best thing I learned this week, 
I just learned there are things that maybe I can put in my ears so I could try diving again. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's good. That's that cool. That is the best thing. That was short, but sweet. Yeah. All right. So mine isn't this week either, but it's pretty recent. Um, and it's, it's, it's firsthand information. It's not, not second or third hand information. Ready? Ready. UFOs are real. I was in Palm Springs and, you know, you've seen all the things on TV, right? With the little things zipping around. We saw three of them. We saw two together up in the sky, just zipping around impossibly fast. You know, when you look at them, you definitely think, all right, definitely drones because too many G's for people to be on them. Um, but really fast and, you know, some kind of drone technology. It was Palm Springs, so it's near an air base. So I'm a little skeptical of the government's claim that they don't know what they are. And then a third one came in after the two were zipping around and they all zipped off together. It was, it was less thrilling, comma, shocking than you would imagine. It was just kind of like, yeah, all right. But anyway, it, they, they were they were real. They were actually there, and I'm definitely a skeptic. So I, I would uh, I'm not predisposed to see UFOs everywhere, despite the one right behind you. <laughs> I, I saw what I saw one when I was around 18, two actually, and really? I mean it was it was we were driving back from a club. I'd had one beer. Other people in the car were a little more messed up, so I would have not trusted them, but. It, it was about this. It looked like a full moon shape. And it was something that was up in the sky. It was kind of green tinted. And it went, it followed, what would that be? The outer atmosphere, kind of the curvature of, and it went from side, it was like, and then a second one followed in its path. But I mean, it was so unbelievably fast, like you're saying, and big. And it went from horizon to horizon over the. Wow. Was, so was, that suggests it was pretty low, right? Well, but it followed the curvature. It didn't go this way. It was like, if you can see my hand, it goes. I do. No, I do. Um, so I don't what, know what, what do you it. think? What do you think they are? No idea. No idea. It was an unexplained flying object. I don't know what if it was extraterrestrial, but don't it was we call them what, what? Don't we call them uh, UAPs now? Un unexplained aerial phenomena. Oh, we don't is say that UFO it? anymore. Well, UFO is very stigmatized, so they've replaced it with UAP, which, you know has a couple of problems, one of which is its closeness to a pop song that is recent. And yeah, that's really the word. Maybe the aliens wrote the pop song. Possible, <laughs> possible. Maybe we can get that's them to be co-write our musical. Right, they can come and help we, us we with have that. To well, find them. We have to find them, yeah. No, I, I'm pretty sure I don't believe it's extraterrestrial, but in fact, I'm sure I don't believe it's extraterrestrial, but- Yours or mine? Or both. But, um, yours, I mean, yours are going back a minute. So a long time ago. So who had that that kind of technology then? Right. That's that was kind of the thing. It's messed up. It's messed yeah. up. They're not telling us stuff. They're not telling us a lot. No. And they and don't we know. Got, a we lot. may have to go back and check out that pizza place again. <laughs> No, <laughs> not that road. No. All right. All right. All wow. roads. All roads. All roads. All roads lead to pizza. <laughs> they do. Yeah, well, thank you so much. Yes. This has thank been you. such a pleasure. Totally my pleasure. It was fun. And uh, we want to thank Maria and Alex, Alex Korloff for producing and editing and everything else in our Cause, show. Because we are very limited in our skills that way. Very. And we also would like our viewers to stop by and leave comments and like the video if you enjoyed yourself. And be sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification button so you don't miss any future episodes. And Thanks to uh, our supporters on Patreon. And if you'd like to become one of them, come to our Patreon site. The links are below the descriptions. And all of our donations go to supporting the magazine to pay for original speculative fiction. The magazine is totally run by volunteers. So all of the money goes to our authors. So if you'd like to see some more speculative fiction, 
hop aboard and join us. So thank you so much and we'll see you next time. Bye.